Hi, Grace City. I'm Taryn, and I'm so happy to be with you today as we help strangers become friends and friends become family. This week, we're continuing our series, This Is Us, as we learn how to be the church God called us to be. If this is your first time, thanks for joining us. You can click the link below to learn more. And we're also gathering in person and online at 9, 30, and 11. So when you're ready, our doors are open for you and your squad. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we learn to live and love like Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame.
see his wounds, he sends his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Great City family. It is so great to be with you this morning. Thanks for choosing this time uh, to set aside, to spend uh, with us as we uh, look at the scriptures together, as we're encouraged and we're challenged by it. Uh, I came across this picture recently. This is uh, my son Logan and I at a uh, wedding this past uh, couple months ago. 
And I love this picture for a lot of reasons. One, because that kid is a stud. Uh, Logan is my middle child, um, and he just loves doing up his hair. But what I love about this picture right here is he's, he's not just dressed up, but he even has the pocket square just like Dad. I mean, it's just one of those little details. And I love when my kids want to dress up and be just like their dad. There's something really cool about it. It just feels awesome to know that my kids want to be like me. And one of the things that Steph and I have as responsibility as parents is to teach our kids how to act, how to speak, how we do things. I was thinking about this uh, uh, a couple years ago with Logan. We were watching a movie, and I'm pretty sure it was Back to the Future for a couple reasons. And one is that's one of our favorite movies, and we watch it quite frequently. Um, but we were watching Back to the Future, and I mean, it's a great movie. You got the flux capacitor, 88.8 miles an hour. Johnny be good, and yes, Johnny be very good. Um, and we were watching this together, but it wasn't the TV edited version. And we didn't realize at the time. And if you've ever had one of those situations where you watched a movie and then you watched it with your kids or your parents or whoever, you start noticing things. Well, my son, my sweet little son, Logan, as we're watching this, one of the characters says a word that we don't use in our home. And he goes, Dad, they just said, and then he says the word out loud. And I said, no, 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 son, we don't say. They goes, yeah, we don't say. And then he said the word again. I said, yeah, son, we don't say that word. And then he said it again. He said, yeah, we don't say that word. And he keeps saying it over. He's like, no, I'm not saying, and then said the word. I'm saying he did. And I'm cracking up, trying not to laugh because he keeps saying this word that we're telling him that we don't say this word. But that's part of what we do as parents. We're teaching our kids how to live as members of our family. We weren't just saying, don't say this. What we were saying was, this is what we say. This is what we don't say. This is how we act and how we don't act. These are the norms, the things that we do for our family. These things that we pass on, these things that frame who we are in our identity as a home. Um, it also, just as a side note, made my heart jump a couple um, beats when my sweet little son, Ryan, my three-year-old, sees a picture of this guy right here this week and says, Daddy! Star Wars. I was super proud. May not have had a more proud moment this week. By the way, if you're playing Grace City Bingo, there's your Star Wars reference of the day. But I love that. I love that we get this honor, this privilege of teaching our kids how we act. And we've been talking these last couple weeks about our church family and how our church family, who it is that we want to be, who it is that we are, but also who we dream to be, who we're growing into. And a lot of that has to do with our norms, our values, um, our identity as the church. And so the first week we talked about it, um, that our family, we are a family that is radically inclusive, radically inclusive, where everyone is welcome and everyone is wanted, including you, because you're valuable. And the second week we said this, that we are a family that is relentlessly committed. We are absolutely committed, centering our lives around Jesus and each other. Now, when we have been talking about these values, these norms, as we've been talking about who we want to be, we're not just pulling these out of thin air. Our conviction, as Thomas and I were preparing and studying through um, these next few weeks and, um, and dreaming about this together, we didn't just come up with phrases that we liked or ideas. We just leaned into the scripture. We studied it. We looked at who the early church was and how they acted. Um, and I was uh, thinking about this I, I, back in 2012. Uh, there was a painting that was discovered that is believed to be the earliest copy of the Mona Lisa, possibly even painted by one of da Vinci's students concurrently when he was painting the Mona Lisa. And it's fascinating because um, the one that's hanging in the Louvre, the, the Mona Lisa as we know it, is so fragile that they don't want to restore it. They don't want to mess with it. But this copy, they chose to do so. They restored it and they cleaned it. They got all the grime and dirt and filth off of it after centuries. And they were amazed at how vibrant and beautiful, all these details that they had missed before. Um, There's one uh, publication, art publication, that's, that described it this. They said the sensational find, this sensational find, this painting that they've, um, this earliest copy, will transform our understanding of the world's most famous picture. It's like we all know what the Mona Lisa looks like, but this helped them see it in a whole new, more vivid, more real, more original way. And it went on to talk about how vibrant her eyes were and her enigmatic smile. 
And it talked about the beautiful detail in the context behind her and um, how it frames her differently. They said, like, man, the Mona Lisa looked 20 years younger than we remembered. And I can't help but think that that's a lot like the scripture. See, buried underneath 2,000 years of church history and buried underneath my preconceived notions and your preconceived notions of what the church is and what it should be like, we have a, the scripture here, our copy of what, um, our description of what the early church looked like, how they lived, how the first church lived in community and what that looked like. And we've been talking about that as we dream about what God has for Grace City. Um, so we've been leaning in this passage. I'd encourage you to read along with me again from Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. And it says this, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The th we're going to get into our third value, our third descriptor um, today of what, who we are and what we dream to be as a church from verses 44 and 45. But before we get there, I want to address verse 43 for a second. And this is one of those verses that may excite you or may even scare you a little bit, but let's look at it for a second. It says, everyone was filled with awe at the money, many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Signs and wonders, miracles. It was that as this was all happening, God was doing amazing things. In fact, if you take Acts 2 and you do like a literary structure uh, from verse 40 to 47, that really the centerpiece of what's described there is that verse that God was doing some amazing things and everyone was filled with awe at it. That's the kind of church that we dream to be a part of, right? That's what you want to be a part of. And yet I was thinking also about what Jesus said about signs and wonders. And it may catch you off guard a little bit. Let, let me bounce over for a second um, to Matthew chapter 12. And, and it says in verse 35, Jesus is talking to people about what life with, with God looks like. And he's describing a different way of living and being in the world. He's talking about things specifically in their heart. He talked about things like the Sabbath and, and about what his resurrection would mean for them. But listen to verse 35. This is Jesus speaking. He says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. Jesus says, hey, the stuff, the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of me working in your life, it'll show the out or the inside will eventually show on the outside. A good man brings forth good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. The battleground, Jesus says, is your heart. And he says, verse 36, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. I want to pause here for just a second. I was actually talking with my mom last week about one of the things I've been most discouraged through the recent season. See, I don't really ever get on social media. I, I just don't. I don't have my own Facebook, but sometimes I get on my wife's and she'll say, hey, you should check this out. But it's been different. The last month, just because of everything been going on, I've actually looked more. I've been on Facebook probably more in the last month than the last several years combined. And I told my mom, I'm unbelievably discouraged. She said, why? And I said, because when I look online and what I'm seeing is the most mean, rude, condescending, crass, nasty things that I've seen online are actually coming from people that claim to be Christians. Now, granted, that's not completely fair because on my wife's social media, a lot of her friends are followers of Jesus and claim to be so. And that's a great thing. But when I read comments like that, it causes something in me just to be sad that that's not who Jesus has called us to be. And Jesus tells us one day we're going to have to give an account for every single thing that we say. And I would believe post. But Jesus says right here, it's not about what's out there. It's the inside those words, those posts, those everything we say or do really comes out of our heart. That's the place where it starts from. And so he continues on in verse 38. He said, some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered, 
a wicked and adulterous generation ask for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Say, wait, what's going on here? I thought signs were good things, right? I mean, it was talking about the new, this first church in Acts 2, that they had many signs and wonders. Isn't that something we should aim for? Isn't that something we should be chasing after? And Jesus says, no. See, we love to be wowed. I, I remember all the way back when I was a kid watching this magician on TV. We had a little VCR tape that we had recorded a thing from David Copperfield. And I was blown away. This guy had... Um, uh, a leather jacket and, and crazy cool hair. And uh, he was doing stuff on waterfalls or his motorcycle was disappearing or he was here then and there the next or this person disappeared. He was doing all these tricks. He would had a car trick and he invited me to play at home. And my brothers and I would go and we would try to find every little, we would try to figure out the trick. We would rewind and slow-mo and pause to try to figure out every single trick that David Copperfield did, because we like to be wowed. There's something about magicians, right? I mean, whether it was Houdini or Penn and Teller or David Blaine, we love to be wowed. But what Jesus says here is basically, if you're following me, you'll be wowed. But if you are following me to be wowed, you're missing the point entirely. He's, he's sitting here talking with these guys about like, I'm concerned about your heart. And they're like, Jesus, do another magic trick for us. Jesus, do something else awesome. Uh, do another miracle, Jesus. And he's like, no, you guys are missing it. What I'm wanting to do, what my death and resurrection is meant to do, what, what I'm praying God is there, there's going to be a, a, a miracle you can only dream of. It's going to be a changed heart. In fact, that's what it really comes down to. I mean, the greatest miracle of all is what? Well, it's a changed heart. I mean, look at what Jesus says in Mark 2, 9 through 10, similar situation. He said, uh, Jesus has got a paralyzed man here and he's going to go heal him. And he also says he's forgiven. And there's some debate like, well, well, which one's, listen to what Jesus says, which is easier, Jesus asked, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. A changed heart or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk. Which is the bigger miracle, Jesus says, like what, that that, 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 that he's healed physically or that he's healed in here. And he says, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. That's the big miracle. So he said to the man, I'll tell you, get up, take up your mat and walk home. He said, yeah, this supernatural thing that's going on, it's pointing to the fact that I can change hearts. There's signs meant to point to that. And you say, well, well, what does that mean? It means all of this, all of this, all the signs and wonders, all these amazing things that God does. And really, magic in our world really doesn't turn heads much anymore, but a changed heart still does. All of the, that is only to point to the greatest miracle of all, a change, the miracle that God does inside our heart. That's the greatest miracle of all. You say, well, what does this have to do with Acts chapter 2? Everything. Absolutely everything. Verse 44 and 45, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Can you imagine a more amazing change of heart for God to create people to be so generous that it looks like that, a church that looks like that, hearts that look like that? I mean, there's something, um, that's, that's something that brings awe and wonder, Right? I mean, we are a family. Here's the third one. We're a family that's irrationally generous. We're a family that's irrationally generous, joyfully trying to outgive our infinitely generous God. And that's who we are, and that's who we dream to be more and more each day as we grow as a church family together. So here's the question that might come up in your mind, right, when, when you hear something like that is, okay, but how much do I actually have to give? Or maybe a phrase a little, how little can I give and still be okay? Right? I mean, we want to know where's that line? Where's that threshold that I have to cross? Uh, one way of looking at it, C.S. Lewis said it this way, I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. If our giving habits don't at all pinch or hamper us, I should say that they are too small. There ought to be things we want to do but can't because our giving expenditures exclude them. He says, Lewis says, man, we should want to give that it actually cause that generosity, that impulse actually causes us to sacrifice. 
something on our end. It's not really generous unless we're sacrificing. But I want to look back at the text because I think there's maybe something else we missed in this. Verse 44, it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Now, our text that we have our English translation is translated. The earliest copies we have, similar to the Mona Lisa, the earliest copies we have were in the Greek. And there's a word that's used here, translated common, um, that in, it's the Greek word koina. And here's what the word means, common or shared. That's how you and I, as we just read through that, and we said oh, they had everything in common. You're like, okay, yeah, they shared. It's like, what's yours is mine, what's mine is yours, mikasa e su casa, nothing belongs to me. And that is true. That is part of the definition. But that's only part of it. The Hebraic understanding, the way this was used in a Hebraic sense was this. In fact, this is the way it's most often translated in the New Testament. This idea of something being profane or dirty or defiled or unclean, unwashed. One Bible dictionary put it this way, something that has been stripped of its specialness. Say, well, what does that mean? All the believers were together and all their things were stripped of their specialness? Yeah. That means is that things that they used to think were so important to them really weren't as much anymore. I mean, my money, my stuff, my home, my, all my possessions, all my belongings suddenly have lost their luster. They have slowly faded and dimmed because my heart is growing bigger and bigger for the people that God has been bringing my way. I value them more, so I value that stuff less. Um, I referenced this last week this, uh, from this commentary by F.F. F. Bruce. Believers were so near the cross in the resurrection and so filled with the Spirit that for a while selfishness was completely swallowed up in love. What's amazing, too, is if you look at church history and the picture of the early church, is their generosity wasn't just limited to each other. And in fact, uh, here's a pic of a, um, a Roman emperor. This is Julian the Apostate. Now, Julian the Apostate uh, was, was in, in um, he was active right as Christianity was beginning to really explode, that this movement of Jesus followers was, was catching fire and people's lives were being changed. And he was uh, totally against it. Ben Johnson describes his tension. He says, Julian tried to use all of the powers of the state to launch a pagan revival. He organized a parallel pagan priesthood based on the church's uh, model. He tried to use legal mechanisms to deny Christians their recently acquired equal rights. He's like, well, we have to fight for our political rights. And he was like, the system was against them, right? But he saw one obstacle, one thing that he could not stop, above all, preventing a return to the old ways. And that was simply this, Christian charity. Christians being radically generous, irrationally generous. In fact, we have a letter that Julian wrote during this time period. And here's what, what Julian the Apostate said. He said, It is disgraceful that when no Jew ever has to beg, in the impious Galileans, these Christians support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men see that our people lack aid from us. What he's saying is, hey, guys, we got a problem here. Not only are these Christians being overwhelmingly generous to each other, but they're actually giving to our people in need, and it's making us look bad. I mean, what a great problem to have when Christians are so generous that it causes a stir that people take notice. Um, Demetrius uh, uh, Constantellus said this, Christianity during this time, destroyed all cultural boundaries limiting charity, extending to the underprivileged as it proclaimed freedom, equality, and brotherhood, transcending sex, race, and national boundaries. Thus, it was not limited to equals, allies, or relatives, or to citizens and civilized men, as was most often the case in other ancient societies. What, what, what this um, Constantellus says is, Look, you want to know what made Christianity so unique? Was that, that overwhelming generosity. The miracle that God had changed hearts to go from being so selfish to so selfless that they cared about others more than their own stuff. That crazy generosity for everyone, irregardless of their race or their occupation or their nationality or 
whatever it was, none of those things mattered anymore. That person was made in the image of God and Christ Jesus had died for them. And that person was more important than any of their possessions, their, their belongings, or even their life. That was radical. A few chapters later, we read this, Acts 4, 32 to 35. It's this just kept going. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. They shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And catch this, in God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. That is crazy generous, irrationally generous. And can I just point out that phrase again? God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. I mean, that's who we are and who we are growing into as a church family. Not out of compulsion. This was not some coerced, uh, socialistic, whatever. This was a group of people whose lives were so wrapped up in the love of Jesus and each other that they with joy gave and sacrificed to care for each other. This is us. This is who we are. This is who we dream to be together. A church where, and I just jotted these down earlier, these thoughts, a church where my friends Robbie and Bill read to kids over at Triangle Elementary and CJ and Mike and Haley and several others mentor kids on their lunch breaks, generous with their time. Um, A church where extremely generous businessmen and women help pay the down payment for our new home for a church and equally generous single moms sacrificially give to make a difference as well. Difference makers. A sacrificial church, a church where guys like uh, Zach and Toby and Caleb and David and Marcia give hours on end to create a space for us to worship and new avenues to be able to connect online. Uh, A church where countless members of our congregation drop off gift cards to help pay for each other's groceries during uh, this time of crisis. Uh, A church where my friends Ray and Jane go into homeless camps every week, doing their laundry for them, inviting them to a feast in their home for Christmas. That's irrationally generous. My, where my friend Beth throws a community dinner for veterans who are hungry. A church where some of our ladies band together to sew masks to help others keep safe from this virus. A church where someone offers forgiveness and opens their heart to reconciling in their marriage. A church where people throw birthday parties for a friend who they have never met. A church where uh, someone throws a wedding for someone who has never had a chance to celebrate. A church where my friend Barb, who has never been here, but recommends this church family because she says, and I quote, I've never heard him preach, but I know those people are generous and serve our community. That's who we are, friends. That's who we are, family. That's who we are growing into as a church family. I'm going to leave you with this. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. This is who we are. This is what we do. And we do it with joy. Thanks for being with us this morning. I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in God's love, would be so overwhelmed by it. That as you continue to look at the cross of Jesus, his sacrifice for you, his resurrection and the power of Jesus living in you, that your stuff would seem less and less important and that you would see Jesus in the eyes of every single person you come in contact with. Grace and peace, my friends. Love you guys. Bye.
Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? As I walk now through the valley Let your love rise above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadow In my weakness your glory Our lives are changed when we stop worrying about what we have and we focus on giving our lives to Jesus. It can seem foolish and even crazy, but that type of generosity changes lives, including our own. That's the church we're called to be. If you're looking to take your next steps in your relationship with Christ, click the link below and we'd love to reach out to you. Now, whether you've been a family for years or this is your first time, we'd love to stay connected. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or our website at wearegrace.city. For our family, thank you for your continued generosity during this unusual time. And for all of you, thank you for joining us this morning. And remember, grace lives here.